I recently wrote a book called Public Diplomacy, Foundations for Global Engagement in the Digital Age. And in that book, I argue that public diplomacy has five key forms, listening, advocacy, cultural diplomacy, exchange diplomacy, and international broadcasting. And I see an expo pavilion and the idea of expos as sitting at the heart of each of these elements. So at an expo, uh, you can listen to other cultures, you can listen to other peoples, and in order to succeed, you have yourself to, to, to listen beforehand. Uh, they're a great place to advocate, to explain particular I ideas, and rally people around uh, action on the international stage. Uh, it's a place where culture can be expressed and experienced. Uh, it, they're great uh, locations for exchange, and as regards international broadcasting, I think expos make excellent material for international broadcasting and are themselves hubs of international communication and, and uh, the sort of material for international news. So I, I see, in a way, an expo as the apotheosis of, of, uh, of public diplomacy and where public diplomacy reaches its most rarefied uh, form. Uh, an expo is all about experience. You can use through um, uh, good design all the different elements that reach a human being. Architecture, uh, sight, uh, sound, uh, text, and, and an experience of moving through a, a, a structured environment to animate a particular idea and, and spark a particular feeling in, in an individual. And at this expo, it's been really interesting to see how smell is being used by a number of pavilions to, to dramatize a point, to give an experience. So the, the ideas that are incubated at expos through the experiences of, of pavilion goers uh, can be among the most deep and profound experiences that people have in a lifetime. Uh, decades after being at an expo, um, uh, expo visitors can remember a really good pavilion and can, can remain attached to an idea that was uh, expressed as, at an expo. What more powerful um, uh, tool of public diplomacy could you, could you imagine? I see participating in an expo as being a great idea for any country, but for the United States it is essential. Why? Because the United States has been positioned in global leadership in, in uh, recent years, uh, recent decades, and uh, other countries look to the United States as a, uh, a leader. If the United States does not attend, or attends with a uh, underwhelming uh, a, a pavilion, uh, that is not only damaging to the image of the United States, but it's also insulting to the host. So the worst thing the US can do uh, is stay away altogether. Uh, second worst thing is to disappoint. Uh, and it's not fair on the United States. Why should it have a special burden uh, to be excellent. Um, well, it has the special burden because of what the United States represents in the world as the leading nation of the, of the free world, and uh, that uh, places a, an extra um, responsibility on, on the United States. And uh, I'm really pleased to see that uh, the U.S. Pavilion uh, at Expo 2020 has happened, uh, and that it has so, so many strengths. Looking to the future, it's really important that the United States build on the success of uh, Dubai 2020 and make sure that it is able to put forward excellent pavilions at forthcoming uh, expos and, uh, and we're hoping also to, to host uh, an expo in the United States. That does not happen without resources.
Uh, in recent years, the United States has had trouble resourcing pavilions because there was a dogma that this needed to be done either by the private sector or uh, with significant sponsorship from the private sector. This is not a burden that is placed on other countries. Germany, for example, has a regular appropriation. They know any expo they participate in, there will be 50 million euros available from the federal budget uh, for that expo. So the designers can start uh, from uh, a, a, a position of confidence that they'll be supported. The United States has not had this advantage. Rather, there's been tremendous uncertainty over whether or not the United States could participate in uh, recent expos. Also, uh, the U.S. needs a standing design also, the U.S. needs a, uh, a standing team at the State Department to prepare for expos. It used to have this during the Cold War. There was a specialist unit at the United States Information Agency preparing for expos. That was all wound up in, in the 1990s. And it's been a, a, a learning process in recent years uh, and a, an uphill struggle to reintroduce a permanent expo structure uh, within the State Department. Now that that structure exists, that expo office exists, the next thing to do is to make sure that there is a permanent and recurring budget for expos. So there is no guesswork around expos. I see a successful expo pavilion as being a bit like a, a cathedral in medieval Europe, where part of the power is in the architecture. You build something that is absolutely tr uh, transporting for the visitor. You fill that cathedral with sites, beautiful um, uh, interior, um, uh, sculptures and uh, ornamentation, uh, but you also have relics in there that they can touch and interact with that will give them a direct experience of something, uh, something sacred. You have sounds, you have smells, chants and incense and music that uh, uh, take them to a, 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 a special place. And when you're, when you're commissioning art to be in this uh, uh, sacred place, uh, you, you ask the greatest artists, the Michelangelo, the Raphael uh, of, of the moment to uh, 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 create the art. And all of these things come together to create a powerful experience. And just as that worked in uh, medieval, early modern Europe, so uh, the Expo uh, Pavilion, the effective Expo Pavilion has worked uh, the same way uh, in, in modern times. As the uh, churches <laughs> discovered uh, in, in the uh, 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 500 years ago, that doesn't happen without money, and expo pavilions are, are, are just the same uh, way. Now, it's possible to do a bad pavilion uh, with a big budget. Um, it's also possible to do an excellent pavilion with, with a limited budget, but you need to have a budget and you need to have skill. And the essential thing to have is uh, skills of uh, a design team uh, that are empowered to do something uh, really remarkable and know that they have the confidence of the uh, government uh, behind them. To me, as a historian who's specialized in the history of public diplomacy in general and U.S. public diplomacy in particular, I think that U.S. pavilions have always had three secret weapons. One was that they were based on listening. The successful pavilions listened first to find out who they were creating a pavilion for. The second thing they had was a dedicated design team with excellent thought going into whatever was being prepared. The third thing is that U.S. pavilions have always put front and center a uh, youth ambassador team, a uh, student guide team, whatever, you, whatever they called it, which was young Americans who spoke the language of the visitors to the fair who were ready and able to be the human face of the United States. And the great strength of American pavilions has been American people. And it's great to see that Expo 2020 has followed in this, this tradition of first class uh, youth ambassadors. The youth ambassadors are the most important thing. At some American pavilions, they've been the only successful thing. Uh, 
at uh, Expo 2020, they have been a, a, a truly wonderful um, a part of a successful uh, pavilion. And I'm so glad to see that great tradition uh, continuing and that coming out of um, Expo 2020 will we'll have uh, a large number of really great young people fired up about public diplomacy. Uh, and, and I really hope that, that, that they'll consider careers uh, in the foreign service as their predecessors have done. And that we can see a new generation of young, energetic uh, American public diplomats moving into the field to put the best face of the United States forward for another, another generation.